As I said earlier, our pastor is away, but uh, we are privileged to have J- Jake Schroeder uh, make himself available. He was with us uh, approximately a year ago. Jake, would you come on up? And Jake has his wife and uh, one of his sons with him as well. Welcome as you fellowship here with us. May God bless you as you share his word. Thank you. Yeah, as Ed was saying, we had a privilege, I had the privilege of speaking here a couple times last year before Pastor Flippen came on. And, and uh, so when Mark called and asked if he'd be willing to do it again, I said, absolutely. And so here we are. And thank you for the invite. Thank you for allowing us to come and worship with you this morning. And uh, let's pray before we get started. Heavenly Father, we come before you. We, we continue to ask you to be in our midst, to teach us your ways, to help us understand your word, help me to proclaim your word in a way that that would that I can learn and first and foremost, and then open our hearts that we can understand your word and just take to heart, let it soak in into every aspect of who we are as your sons and daughters, as your people, and as your church. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. This past Monday morning, I woke up, or my nose woke up, and it sensed that something was seriously wrong. And it sent a message to my brain pretty quick, and my brain pushed that message on to my eyes. My eyes opened up to confirm what my nose was sensing. Lots of smoke. Lots of smoke in the house because the windows were open, and lots of smoke everywhere outside. As I looked outside, it's just smoke everywhere. We live at Blackstrap, and and normally I can see the lake from where we're at. And I'm going to turn this thing so it's not turning my pages on me. We live at the lake at Blackstrap Lake, close to the lake there, and, and normally I can see the lake pretty clearly. Couldn't see anything. And there's a ravine behind our house. Normally I can see the bottom of the ravine. It's probably 100 feet deep. It's nice and green down there. And the other side of the ravine, uh, nice green trees. Normally I can see all that. It was just, I could see it, but it was very smoky, very dim. And I could have responded in fear and said, what's this all about? Like, where'd that lake go? Where'd the, where'd the trees go? How come it's all so dim? But I knew better. I knew that things were not as they seemed. It was only a smoke screen that I was looking through. Things were not as they seemed. And that's the title of my message today. Things are not as they seem. If we watch the news and we see the rulings of our government in our country, and if we follow them closely, we probably realize in in 2005, our Canadian government ruled in uh, legislated uh, same-sex marriage. It's legalized in Canada in 2005, something which the U.S. has done in the last two weeks. And also, if our Canadian government has been enter- entertaining in the last year here at Euthanasia, the right to die. And I believe in some provinces it's actually legal under strict rules and regulations at this point in time. The government has also taken out prayer from government meetings. If we look at all these things, we wonder what's our government up to? Who's in control there anyway? You wonder if the enemy has taken control? Is God even in this? I hope that after we look at the passage this morning in Revelation, if you want to turn there, Revelation chapter 1. I hope that after we have looked at this passage and examined what Revelation 1 shows us in other parts of Scripture, that we will come to realize that things are not as they seem. Now, having said that, I want to say that as Christians, as the church, I don't want us, I don't believe it's right for us not to respond. I don't believe it's right for us to protest. The world knows more for what we're against than what we're for already. But I believe it calls us, as it has done in the past, to make a stand as the people of God, as a church, where do we stand on these issues? And not just say, well, that's okay. Or we need to stand, 
make a stand, take a stand, based on the word of God, and say, what does God say about these issues and circumstances? In the past year, the Holy Spirit has put it on my heart, and I, I still don't know why except to teach me, but to read the book of Revelation. Read the book of Revelation and figure out what does it say, what does it mean. And it, it's been a book, I've been in school, in Bible school for four years. And Revelation has been a book that I've kind of avoided. There's so much, so much stuff in there, there's so much imagery in there for interpretation that I've been, should I say, afraid to check it out. But in the last year, there's been a hunger in me to look at the book of Revelation and end times and to study them, and I've done so. And I've read a lot of books that are written about the book of Revelation. There's lots of different ideas as to interpretations. One thing I come out of this with at this point, and I'm hoping I'm still learning, let's keep it that way, is that the book of Revelation is not so much a book of gloom and doom, which I may have thought before, as it is a book that calls us to extreme discipleship in Jesus Christ. There is an urgency about the writing in the book like never before. There's a story about some seminary students. They... You, you know how it goes, you've been in school, you go to school and you study, and uh, and you just get tired of studying every now and again. These guys would go and play basketball in the local gym, shoot some hoops and waste some energy that way, and it just clears your mind and helps you focus again. These guys would go there and do that in the local gymnasium, and, and they'd leave their books alongside, their backpacks and books alongside the wall. And the local janitor there who allowed them to play and... Uh, and uh, later cleaned up after them would read their books. One day one of the, uh, or they were done shooting hoops and they come back to their backpacks and their bags and, and one of the students sees the janitor is reading his Bible. So he asks the janitor, so what are you reading? And janitor says, well, I'm reading the book of Revelation. And this student being much like me is just like, whoa, that's tough stuff to how, how can you figure it out? He asked his janitor, so what does all of that mean? And his janitor looks up at him and says, it means that Jesus is going to win. We look around at what's going on, churches and in government and stuff, and we wonder if the enemy is in control. But he's not. Things are not the way they seem. Jesus is going to win. So if you have your Bibles open to Revelation, I'd like to look at chapter 1, actually. If we uh, start reading in verse 1, 1 to 3, it says, The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who testifies to everything he saw, that is, the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Blessed is the one who reads the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear it and take it to heart. Take to heart what is written, because the time is near. There's two things I just want to pick up on here. Two things that just kind of jumped out at me. The first thing is it's a book that's been written to be read, to be heard, and to take to heart. Read it, hear it, take it to heart. James says, in James 1, verse 22, Do not merely listen to the word, and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like a man who looks at his face in the mirror. And after looking at himself, he goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But the man who looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues to do this, not forgetting what he has heard, but doing it, he will be blessed in what he does. The word of God is made, is written to us, it's handed to us to read, to hear, to take to heart. The second thing I noticed in this first three verses is an urgency. 
says the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. Then in verse 3, because the time is dear. If we look at end times, if we look at the prophecies that Jesus left his disciples and us, Matthew 24 and so forth, we can clearly see with all the rumors of war and the war going on and terror and, 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 and the weather changed, the earthquakes and everything, the time is drawing near. It was draw, drawing near when, when this book was written. It's drawing even nearer now and it calls for us, our attention. It's an urgency. Let's read verses 4 to 8. It says, to the seven churches in the province of Asia, grace and peace to you from him who is and who was and who is to come, from the seven spirits before his throne and from Jesus Christ who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead and the ruler of the kings of the earth. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood, and has made us to be a kingdom and priest to serve his God and Father. To him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. Look, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And all the peoples of the earth will mourn because of him. So shall it be. Amen. I am the Alpha and Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. First thing we notice there is it's written to churches. It's written to seven churches specifically in the province of Asia. There was something going on there that they needed this letter. This letter was meant again to be read, to be heard, and to take into heart. There's times way back as years ago when they started, we started singing courses in church. And we'd sing one line over and over and over and over. And I thought, I, I was a little cynical, but I've repented of that since. I thought, what's the use? And then one day, it was very clear that, you know, we were singing actually a It was out of a hymn, it went, is well with my soul. That the Holy Spirit spoke to me quite clearly and said, the first time you sing it, it's just like, it's well with my soul. Good, all good. Then by about the fourth time, it's just like, whoa, whoa. Is it well with my soul? By about the tenth time I came to the point, it is well with my soul. And I think that's what the, the, the Word of God is meant to do as well. Not just saying it. These younger people in, in worship bands have some to teach us. That's what the Word of God is meant to do. It's meant to be read. It's meant to be heard. It's meant to sink in, take it to heart. And sometimes when we read the Word of God, we got to read it again. And read it again. And when we're done, we read it again. Because every time I read the, even the same text, it, there's something the Holy Spirit puts in me, something that he brings to life that I didn't see before, something that's new to the place I'm in at that point in time. I'm sure you've experienced that. In Joshua 1.8, God tells Joshua, meditate on the word. Meditate. On what does it mean? To live in it. Breathe it. Let it soak in. Let it be a part of every part of what you do and who you are. Let's go on and read verses 9 through 11. It says, I, John, your brother and companion in the suffering and kingdom and patient endurance that is ours in Jesus was on the island of Patmos before, because the word of the, uh, because the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. On the Lord's day I was in the spirit and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet, which said, write on a scroll what you see and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. First thing is he identifies himself as John. He's done that three times already in the first couple of verses in the introduction, John. So this John, according to uh, commentaries, is 
for the most part, they agree on one thing. This John is the John, the disciple of Jesus Christ, one of the twelve that Jesus had personally taught and walked with him while he was on this earth. And he writes, he says, I, John, your brother and companion in the suffering, identifies himself as a brother in Christ, but also a brother somehow. Commentators believe he was very closely linked to these churches in Asia, the seven churches. He knew them quite personally. And some suggest that he was a pastor there. And you would think, possibly your first thought, if you haven't read the book or really looked into it, is John was on the on an island of Potmus because the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. Was he a missionary there? No. You see, the government in Asia at that time had uh, made a rule that or believed themselves to be higher than God and everybody needed to bow and worship to them. They thought they were in absolute, ultimate authority over everything. And everybody, even churches at that point, needed to bow and worship and pay allegiance to them. I wonder if John wasn't thinking about a guy named Daniel, his book, and the three guys, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, how they were thrown in the fiery furnace because they didn't bow to Nebuchadnezzar's idol. I wonder if he wasn't thinking about that and feeling about like he was in the same boat. Those three guys got brought out of the fire because they didn't go up in flames. God saved them. They came out of the fire. Nebuchadnezzar, Babylonian government changed their minds and they said, anybody that doesn't worship the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego is going to be put to death. Well, that's a drastic measure. What a change. I wonder if John wasn't thinking about Jesus' teaching as he walked with him and Jesus said, hey, you're going to suffer for my cause. He does kind of say something like that. He says, your brother and, and companion in the suffering and kingdom and patient endurance that are ours in Jesus. I wonder if he wasn't thinking about that when the government exiled him to Patmos as a, a prisoner because he wouldn't bow to their authority. As I was reading about this, I was thinking, oh, wow, the government is that sure cruel. Like, I, I was just trying to figure this out and trying to make sense of all of this, and then it kind of dawned on me that if, if John had not been on the island of Patmos, would we have this book, this letter in this book? Would we have the letter of Revelations written to us? Hmm. If John had not been on the island of Patmos, would his churches have benefited from this letter, this prophecy? The churches, the seven churches in Asia? John may have been scrambling, running around, trying to get from one to another in Asia and couldn't get there anyway. Not as quick as this letter, maybe. Then it dawned on me, here we have a government in Asia that is dominating, that is ruling and thinking they are their own gods and everybody needs to bow to them. And they didn't even realize they were being used as a tool by Almighty God himself to further his kingdom in a very dramatic way. Just like Joseph was. I wonder if Potiphar knew that he was being used as a tool by Almighty God in his hand to further God's kingdom by having Joseph there, by having him put in prison, by bringing him out, by training him to do what God had specifically wanted wanted him to do. You see, it might seem that evil has taken control of our land. Even our government might be ruled by what we think is evil just because of rules and regulations and legislations they bring in. 
But I believe in the word, God tells us things are not as they seem. Jesus will win. Now, having said all that about government, I, I don't want you not paying your taxes anymore or anything. I want to make sure it's a healthy balance. In Romans 13, Paul says, Everyone must submit himself to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, he who rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted. We are commanded in the word of God, to honor authorities, to pray for them, to uphold them. But when it comes to regulations and legalizations that are opposed to God's word, we need to, above all else, fall on God's word and say, what does it say about that? Our allegiance to Jesus Christ needs to come first and foremost. So the first point coming out of that, I would want to say that Jesus is king of all kings, king of all authorities, king of all rulers. Jesus is king. Let's go on and read verses 12 through 20. John says, I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me. And when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And among the lampstands was someone like a son of man, dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet and with a golden sash around his chest. His head and hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like blazing fire. His feet were like bronze glowing in the furnace, and his voice was like the sound of rushing waters. In his right hand he held seven stars, and out of his mouth came a sharp double-edged sword. His face was like the sun shining in all its brilliance. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. Then he placed his right hand on me and said, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead, and behold, I am alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys of death and Hades. Write there for what you have seen, what is now and what is to take place later. The mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand I know, and those of the seven golden lampstands is this. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. There might be people who think, come to the conclusion John had been on the island for a while. He didn't have proper drinking water maybe and not enough food. And therefore, maybe he was hallucinating. It's fairly clear here in verse 12 where John says, I heard this voice and I turned, I had to turn around to see who it was that was speaking to me. It was a physical turning around in order to see who it was that was speaking to him. Then John goes on to talk about the Son of God, which is no other than Jesus Christ. And explain what he's seen. I don't want to delve into that. I want to take one practical application out of this section. And that is when he says, I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me. And when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And among the lampstands was someone like the Son of Man. And in verse 20, Jesus explains to John. The seven golden lampstands, he says, are the seven churches. Now we have all over in New Testament, Jesus talked about, all the writers talk about how the Holy Spirit lives in us. Sometimes we might just not get a full picture of what that means. Jesus here shows John a picture of how he is walking among the churches in Asia. I wonder if John wasn't thinking that I'm here alone. I've been cast out on Patmos. I've been left here to die. I'm the only one that's concerned about these churches. I mean, I, I, I know these guys, and obviously his heart was there. But how was he going to minister to them? And Jesus comes along and 
gives him a very, very clear picture of himself walking among the churches. He is with them. Jesus died for them. How could he not care for them? Jesus died for us. He is with us in spirit. He cares for us. He knows everything about us. There was a time when I when I was in school, I I get into trouble every now and again. And there's too many times where I was brought to the principal's office. And I remember one time when my dad was called in to come in and take care of stuff. Now that can be a scary thing and it can be a very comforting thing. Depends on what I've done. If I hadn't done anything guilty or deserving punishment, I was I was quite, hey, my dad's here. What are you going to do? On the other hand, if I had done something wrong, I also knew that my dad would deal with me at home, out behind the barn somewhere. That was a serious thing. One thing I did know is that my father had my back there. And as I say this, I'm also aware that some of you don't have, have not grown up with, in such an atmosphere where your father had your back, and I'm sorry. It's not the way it should be. However, I want to make sure that we see that our Father in Heaven sent His Son Jesus to die on the cross for our sins. Now that's having our back. He had our back before we turned to Him. While we had done wrong, there is no earthly father who measures up to that, no matter how good he is. So what difference does that make if we think about the Holy Spirit living in us, if we think about this mental picture of Jesus Christ walking in our midst? It should make all the difference, all the difference in how we do church, how we treat people. In our motives and everything, it should go right down to the heart, shouldn't it? It should also make a difference in how bold we are before the throne of grace, and declaring God's word to the people around us. How bold we are as Christians, how bold we are as a church, should make all the difference, shouldn't it? Jesus says in uh, Matthew sixteen eighteen, he says, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail. That is not a suggestion, that's a command, that's a done deal. Jesus goes on in, in Matthew 28, the passage we might know quite well, the Great Commission, where he tells his disciples, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Lo, I am with you to the end of the age. He doesn't say, all authority in heaven and on earth will be given to me. He says, it has been given to me. It's a done deal. Paul in Romans 8.31 says, If God is for you, who can be against you? So I guess the question we got to ask ourselves, what are we afraid of? I read this one book on, on the book of Revelation that's uh, by Daryl Johnson. It's, I believe it's called Discipleship on the Edge. And he's got a, a couple lines in there I just had to read. I had to read so they're word for word because they spoke volumes to me. He says, with Revelation glasses on, we realize that we work from the victory, not towards it. The Lamb is already on the throne. The church enters the battle with evil in order to win, or not in order to win, let's get that straight, but because Jesus Christ has already won. And I just want to add, 
The final outcome is not up for grabs. It's a done deal. So what are we afraid of? 1 Peter 5, 8. Peter says, he warns us, the church. He warned the church then. He warns us with the same words. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. I'm a hunter. I've never hunted lions. But I have watched shows as to how lions operate. They'll go after a herd of wildebeest. And they'll chase them until they see some falling back a bit. And they'll chase those. They'll separate those from the bunch. Until some more fall back. And so on and so forth. Until finally they take out the the weakest link. They take out the weakest one. The devil prowls around like a roaring lion. Looking for someone to devour. I don't want to give Satan too much credit, but we also can't ignore him. He is real. He is wreaking havoc wherever he can, especially where God's work goes forth. I believe sometimes we've made stands in church in general on things that are not important, and sometimes we need to make stands on Things are are important that are salvation issues. And therefore, I believe that Satan has done what he does best. He's a father of lies. He distracts us from doing what we need to do, from being the church, from reaching out. It may seem, if you look around, it may seem that Satan is winning again that maybe God is distant. But things are not the way they seem. Jesus is going to win. Point number two coming out of this, Jesus is king of the church. Can we trust him with it? Jesus is king of all kings, all authorities. Jesus is king of his church. He died for us, everybody, Christian. Point number three, I'm hoping just to confirm that a little better by point number three Jesus will have the last word for that I want to look at Revelation 5 Revelation 5 verse 1 starting at verse 1 John says then I saw the right hand of him who sat on the throne in his Then I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll with writing on both sides and sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice, Who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll? But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth could open the scroll or even look inside. I wept and I wept, John says, but no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll or look inside. Then one of the elders said to me, do not weep. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. Then I want to jump to chapter 6, verse 1. I watched as the lamb opened the first of the seven seals. Then I heard one of the four living creatures say in a voice like thunder, come. I looked and there before me was a white horse. Its rider held a bow, and he was given a crown, and he rode out on the, as a conqueror bent on conquest. When the lamb opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature say, Come. Then another horse came out, a fiery red one. Its rider was given power to take peace from the earth and to make men slay each other. To him was given a large sword. I want to stop there. There's a couple things that jumped out at me when I read that. First thing is, there's only one who is worthy to open that scroll. It's Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, who has been slain for our sins. 
I am so thankful. He's the only one in control. He died for us. How he loves us. The second thing is in in chapter 6. He, it, John says how the lamb opened the seals and, and a rider came out and it was given, power was given to him to, to wreak havoc as a conqueror. And then he says another seal was opened and power was given. You get the picture? Five times in a couple of verses there he says power was given. Given. Given by who? None other than Jesus Christ, the Lamb who was slain. He's in absolute control and he will give power where he wants. And he will hold back power where he wants. Reminds me of a saying that says there's nothing that's entered your life that has not passed through the hands of our Heavenly Father. Also reminds me of a story of Job. I think most of us, or hopefully all of us, know the story of Job. Satan was doing his thing. He was prowling like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. And he seen Job. Job was a good man. And he said to God, let me have a piece of that guy. He's going to turn on you. And God said, I'll let you have a piece of him, but this is as far as you go. You cannot take his life. God sets the boundaries. He gives permission, but he also sets the boundaries as to far he's, how far he's going to let the evil one go. He is in absolute control. He will have the last word, won't he? There's a story of, of missionaries. They had gone on a mission field, to a mission field in the jungle somewhere, and they were new to this area, and their, their house wasn't real good, so their front door was not real tight. One day they went out on their missions and they came home and they realized the door was swung open into the house. So they walked inside and here's this big snake slithered into the house. And frantically they ran out. They didn't know what to do with this thing. It's huge. It's bigger than a man. Bigger than a human being. And so they ran to the neighbor and, and, and the neighbor knew what to do. He came over with a machete. He walked inside. He was quite brave. He decapitated the thing. Came back out and he said, it's a done deal. He's a goner. But he said, you're going to have to wait a little bit because he's, he's going to, you know what? He's going to kick around a bit and, and do some damage in there. You know, the snake's neurology and blood flow system is such that it doesn't realize that the head is missing for a long time. So this missionary couple was outside and they were just waiting and, you know, waiting this thing out. And meanwhile, this snake was, was thrashing furniture and, and banging the walls and the windows and stuff inside and, and doing a, a whole lot of damage. But this missionary couple says at one point during that time, they realized it dawned on them, this is just like Satan, isn't it? He's been defeated. He just doesn't know it. And if he does... He will wreak havoc wherever he can, however he can, which we can see as God, Jesus, has predicted in his word. But last times, end times. But Satan is a goner. Jesus defeated him on the cross. It may seem otherwise, but I want to reassure you and I hope... Somehow this passage has brought some clarity in God's ruling over everything. That things are not the way they seem in our lives. We see through smoke. We don't see clearly, but things are not the way they seem. God is still in control. Jesus, I want to agree with the janitor in closing. Jesus wins every time. Let's pray. And I'm going to ask the song team to come up. Thank you, Lord God, that you are in absolute control of everything. Father, sometimes we just, we, we are nearsighted, we see what is here, what is now, the legislations, and we fear. Father, that is not from you. 
We thank you for your holy word and how it speaks to us, how you have allowed it to come to us and how it's meant to mold us and shape us. We ask you, Lord God, that you would protect your church, Christians here on earth. Help us to grow in you, to learn from your word, to become more extreme in our discipleship, more devoted. We just pray, Lord, as we leave here, that you would continue to work in our lives, and sometimes that wreaks a little havoc. Help us to not lose the focus, but to see you in and through it. And come along, brothers and sisters, and encourage them, and vice versa. We thank you, Lord God, for the church that you have instituted, and we know that you will build it, and it will not be destroyed. We pray, Lord, that we would be bold in the way we uh, speak your word, in the way we, way we proclaim your message to the people around us with love and patience, yet firmness. We pray, Lord, that you would just go before us as we leave here, and we thank you for this opportunity to worship you today, and we pray that this worship would just continue throughout the whole week. In your precious Son, pray.